What's up, guys? I hope you're doing well. So, um, basically, I did a video three, two, three months ago or something like that. I don't know. Uh, about um, one of the Fed governors coming out and giving a speech about a central bank digital currency. And it's one of those things. I'm think, I think this is one of the... Um, it's been an interesting development with this, right? Uh, because... I know of some people who have been talking about this for at least two years, like 2020, somewhere in there, early 2020, right? And they were literally just like called conspiracy theorists and tinfoil hatters the entire time, right? And now, um, I mean, like the Fed has a whole kind of research paper about it. It's 40 pages. I downloaded it and started breezing through it. So you guys have that to look forward to as well, because that's one of those things I want to kind of, it's definitely worth looking more into, which is kind of the same idea of what they're talking about. But uh, I don't know. We'll just get right into it. We'll go straight into the screen share. And this is a uh, the transcript for the speech done by uh, Leo Brainerd, uh, Vice Chair Brainerd. Um, she was the one who did the first one as well, I think. Um, the first um, central bank digital currency video I did, I think it was also based off of her uh, research or her opinion or whatever it was at the time. Um, anyways, oh, don't forget making it a little bit bigger for you guys so hopefully you can see um but anyways and so with technology driving profound change it is important we prepare the financial system of the future and not limit our thinking to the financial system of today no decision has been made about whether the u.s central bank digital um, no decision has been made about whether a U.S. central bank digital currency will be a part of that future, but it is important to undertake the necessary work to inform any such decision and to be ready to move forward should the need arise. Um, that's also, um, I don't remember if it was in the previous video, but I remember reading it somewhere where like they did some research, maybe it was a white paper or something with a, the tech, like some department in MIT setting up like it was, a, it, was a, it was either a server or something basically seeing if they could actually create one. Right. And like actually have it run to a significant extent. Cause I mean, if you're, if anything's going to kind of, I guess, challenge the dollar's hegemony right and it, it has to be able to withstand that amount of volume or whatever it may be and i mean i don't really see why it wouldn't but regardless something along those lines um and basically as always and as always we're going to use something or they're going to use something uh basically that the free market did and basically oh this is bad this is why we need to have a centralized one one that's under a central authority right and so naturally picks the two wide, widely used stable coins as she says have come under considerable pressure um i think one i forget what the names were is um i'm not a huge crypto guy as a disclaimer um or at least I don't get into the uh, the the other like the temporary or the smaller coins or whatever. Like I just kind of deal with like you know Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, I look into those and look into some of like kind of the infrastructure. I'm not like one of those who is going to go like trade Dogecoin or whatever. That's not I I don't care. Sorry, but um, I think it was it was called like Terra or something. Um. One of and then maybe something with tether. I don't remember the exact ones off the top of my head, uh, but like one completely collapsed and one that was a very one of the major stable coins temporarily dipped below its um its valuation, right? And so it's supposed to stay like pegged one to one with the dollar, but it dropped down below for whatever reason. Um, maybe that was tether because I remember reading something about how um. 
like they found that surprise surprise the the assets or whatever that were backing it weren't exactly what they said they were um something along those lines again don't hold me to that do your own research in that respect um anyways so these events the crashing of the stable coins um underscore the need for a clear reg for clear regulatory guardrails to provide consumer and investor protection protect financial stability and ensure a level playing field for competition and innovation across the financial system which of course is quote unquote exactly what the fed does isn't it um especially and, and this is the same exact um, one of the same arguments that we had with wildcat banking in the 1860s to the passage of the Federal Reserve Act. I mean, the whole you got to prov- you have to protect the consumer or, and the investors and stuff when. I mean, it kind of just makes them stupid, like if because the harder are they, the more when you're trying to pro- it's kind of like a kid, I guess, like if you keep like protect trying to protect them then they're not going to do the cream of the crop isn't always going to rise i guess i don't know i'm having trouble apparently articulating that concept but we're just going to move on um so the rapid ongoing evolution of the digital financial system um at the national and international level should lead us to frame the question not as whether there is a need for a central bank issued digital dollar today but rather whether but rather whether there may be conditions in the future that may give rise to such a need um so i guess basically her argument or by her stating this, it seems like she believes that we do need a central bank itch issued digital dollar. Um, and that, however, I guess um, the conditions aren't ripe for it or whatever, that it should be needed. Um, but anyways, the Federal Reserve has operated alongside the private sector, providing a stable currency and operating key aspects of the payment system while also supporting private sector innovation. And we kind of talked about uh, this whole providing a stable currency. Well, I guess it's slightly different than, well, it's definitely different than talking about price stability. Never mind. <laughs> Going somewhere that I, change my mind on i guess i was thinking you know price stability and stable currency are kind of they're kind of related i guess you could make that i guess you could make that argument but i don't know i haven't thought that one through enough to really articulate it well or give it justice but so we're just going to continue um at present consumers and businesses do not consider whether the money they are using is a liability of the central bank as with cash or as a commercial bank as with bank deposits uh confidence in commercial bank money is built upon deposit insurance banks access to central bank liquidity and banking regulation and supervision um and that kind of really just depends on who you're talking to because the people who really pay attention to this kind of stuff some of them i mean that's a major consideration um I can see what like the general masses of people, they're not going to know the difference between like a central bank digital currency or their bank deposits. Not really, especially if those deposits kind of go through commercial banks, which is one of the kind of proposals that we may get into later. Um, I don't remember if she states it in the speech, but um, it's somewhere in that 40 page um, booklet or whatever. Um, basically on it, the, the white paper they made. And I'll read the title off and possibly up try to find the link to the PDF. And I might put that in the video's description as well. So you could just find the PDF um, of the whole thing and you can go through it yourself if you want. Um, so new forms of digital money, such as stable coins that do not share these same pro- protections, could reintroduce meaningful counterparty risk into payment systems. Um uh, Basically, you could compare this to the counterparty risk that we saw in wildcat banking, or I guess it's kind of the analogy she's making to where it's like, you know, even individual banks could have their own currencies and definitely like different states and such. And so you 
there was a lot more to question on who the other side of the transaction is or even particular to the specific currency or in this case i guess coin whatever uh crypto coin you're using um so as we have seen such new forms of money can lose their promised value relative to fiat currency harming consumers or at large scale creating broader financial stability risks right and i kind of I guess kind of chuckled a little bit by the value relative to fiat currencies, even though, I mean, the kind of the definition of fiat currency is like, there's nothing packing it and there's no, there's nothing there. It's, or well, I guess you could argue it's government backed. And so if you don't use it, you know, I mean, you have to pay taxes in us dollars and if you don't, you go to jail. So there's that backing, but that's a completely separate topic. Um, so we have seen these risks, Posed by the widespread use of private monies in the 19th century, active competition among issuers of private bank or bank notes led to inefficiency, fraud, and instability in the U.S. payment system, which ultimately necessitated a uniform form of money backed by a national government. What I was talking about earlier with the wildcat banking in the 1800s. Um, same argument. Um that's an interesting analogy, though. Now that I think about it more, kind of really comparing it to like t the time back then to now in the grand scheme of things makes a lot of, like where the financial system in terms of like the whole cryptocurrency thing. And then again, there's a lot of nuances into the whole crypto space that I'm not going to be able to kind of really do justice because I know like... Um, Yes, I am not huge into crypto, but I do have quite a bit of a uh, programming background uh, with mostly computational physics from what I did in college and some internships and stuff that I did. Um, so it's like I understand the algorithms and stuff behind them, but I'm just not huge into specifically applying it to that, right, to the actual currencies. I'm not big in the space. I just It's just a preference. Not very interested to the smaller things besides like like bitcoin and ethereum like i said it earlier um i deal with those things but otherwise i just i'm sorry i don't care <laughs> um some of the infrastructure is pretty interesting though but it's something to watch but again not my forte um so basically in future circumstances, CBDC, the central bank digital currency, uh, could coexist with and be complementary to stable coins and commercial bank money by providing a safe central bank liability in the digital financial ecosystem, uh, much like cash currently coexists with com commercial bank money, right? And so, I mean, when you really kind of think about like what is money to begin with, and like it really depends on kind of your counterparty. Right. And so when you direct deposit your paycheck or whatever you do into a bank, I mean, that shows up on the liability side of the bank balance sheet because they owe they owe you that money. It's technically not really yours. You're just owed it. Right. Um, to whereas if you have a central bank digital currency, that liability or I'm sorry, that dollar, so to speak, is now a liability of the Fed. Right. And so. And that's completely different, right? And it's kind of that, that from the perspective of the individual, you probably won't see much of a difference. Um, specifically, if that person isn't very, we'll say, well versed into the nuances of that. Um, it's kind of the, and by nuances, I mean the same, the same reason why, um, like quantitative easing isn't necessarily money printing and it's not necessarily going to, uh, put more dollars on the balance sheets of non-bank individuals, non-bank entities, which is what causes, uh, consumer price inflation, right? Um, there's been kind of a big deal, at least the past few years, um, at least big argument from what I've noticed, at least from the people that I listen to and talk to and such. But anyways, um, so it could also coexist according to this. And they, I believe I haven't fully read the 40 page white paper yet, but um, from my understanding, they actually place like multiple models uh, side by side to one to where it's like CBC only another where it's like, um, 
a combination of the two and something like that. Um, so here we go. In some circumstances, a widely available CBDC could serve as a substitute for commercial bank money, CBDC on its own, uh, possibly reducing the aggregate amount of deposits in the banking system. And a CBDC would be attractive to risk-averse users during times of stress. Um, I'm not really sure how that really affects, because, I mean, like, Unless you want to call into question the um, the assurance of the FDIC, so you know the 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 entity, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, I think corporation, whatever the acronym stands for, that insures like bank deposits up to two to two hundred and fifty thousand, I believe. Um, then you're not really worried about the the counterparty risk of bank deposits, not entirely. Um, Right and now, if you're a much bigger player, then you're probably going to have a lot more. If you have more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth in cash, unless like you unfortunately had someone pass away or you inherited it somehow or whatever, if you earned that, then you probably have enough financial education to not have this problem to begin with. Um, so we'll just leave it there. Um, but anyways. Continuing on, according accordingly, um, if the Federal Reserve were to move on, accordingly, if the Federal Reserve were to move forward on CBDC, um, it would be important to develop design features that could mitigate such risks, uh, such as offering a non-interest-bearing CBDC or limiting limiting the amount of CBDC a consumer can hold or transfer, right? And so. Hmm. I'm trying to think of kind of something to compare it to in the system now. I mean, like, base essentially with the statement, you wouldn't be allowed to um, have a certain amount of money. So you, they would have control over how much you would own or be owed, I guess. And then uh, in terms of and then transferring, the only thing I can think of is like some banks, if you want to, like, uh, for example, Zelle someone or transfer electronically that way, because I know some bank, my bank does that. Um, and there's a cap on that. Like you can only do like, it's like, a a thousand dollars a day or something like that is the only kind of somewhat equivalent thing I can think of, but that's not an overarching cap on how much it's only through that specific mode. Right. And then it's, then you're getting into nuances of problems with clearing houses and stuff now, at least from my understanding. Um, but in terms of a, a central bank digital currency, they'd be talking about like that's you can transfer, say, for example, a thousand dollars a day, period. You can only spend a thousand dollars, period. You're done. Like that's kind of what it seems to me. Um, and that, of course, that all be tracked. Um, so a U.S. CBDC uh, may be one potential way to ensure that people around the world who use the dollar can continue to rely on the strength and safety of the U.S. currency to transact and conduct business in the digital financial system. Uh, more broadly, it is important for the United States to play a lead role in the development of standards governing international digital finance transactions involving CBDCs consistent with the norms of privacy, accessibility, interoperability and security right and so basically us has to stay on top of things um and then basically relying on the dollar strength um as if like the euro dollar system isn't kind of an example of that so to speak um but i'm not gonna go kind of too far down that rabbit hole because that is kind of a um a whole I'll say I don't want to get overextended in my argument, kind of like start talking about beyond the breadth of my expertise, we'll say, of what I've, I'm decent, at least decently versed in. Um, that's something that I've, I'm actively like listening and reading about all the time because um, it's a hole in my knowledge. And it's definitely, it's very, very interesting. But anyways, um, here's the discussion paper that I was bringing up. The 40-page one is called Money and Payments, the U.S. Dollar in the Age of Digital Transformation. To solicit – oh, it's all in caps. That's the end of the um, the title, I think. 
And so the pa- it came out in January, and the paper's comment period ended a couple weeks ago. Um, and then basically they're going to, I guess, publish a summary in the near future. I also thought it was interesting that she specifically used the term stakeholders. Um, so just kind of getting that little stakeholder capitalism vibe in there, but could just be coincidence. (laughs) I don't know. might be, but, um, so the paper emphasizes that the CBDC would best serve the needs of the United States by being privacy protected, intermediated, widely transferable and identity verified. Um, An intermediated system in which private intermediaries, including banks, would offer accounts and digital walls to facilitate the management of a CBDC um, would leverage the private sector's existing identity frameworks and service provision to consumers while mitigating the risk of disintermediation. Right. Okay. So actually, I think here's a link to it now. Um, so you could just click this link and most likely get straight to it. And, and it's not hard to find anyway, even if you can't, even if that isn't the correct link, which I'd be surprised if it wasn't. I mean, you can literally just look it up. I mean, that's how I found it, it was literally Google name of paper. And there you go. Um, but yeah, this has definitely been something that's been like developing recently that really needs to get talked about more, at least from my understanding. I mean, I don't see a lot of a lot of different people talking about it really seems kind of more of a niche thing um but yeah anyways that's all i got for you guys and i'll work on getting kind of going through that paper um and maybe trying to find other things as well that are applicable to see how that especially if you guys show interest in it but anyways that's all i got for you guys tonight so i hope you guys have a good night and i'll see you on the next one